Let's welcome Professor Hod Lipson. Thank you. So, for almost a century, we've been trying to build intelligent machines. We've been trying to build these robots that somehow will imitate the shape and form and behavior of us humans. This is 1939 uh, World Fair in New York City, uh, a big event, uh, not unlike this one, where we're trying to predict the future. Everybody's trying to see what the future might, be lo might look like. This is a robot that was presented there. It could walk, it could talk. I think it could even light a cigarette and smoke it. Uh, really important things that robots should need to do, but one thing was lacking. It had no intelligence. Uh, we should simply do not know how to build anything intelligent. It turns out that it was very, very difficult, so we switched to fantasy. Hollywood moved on forward, and we kept on imagining what robots and intelligent machines might actually look like. Sometimes these are going to be happy robots, good robots. Sometimes they're going to be bad robots. Sometimes they're going to be robots that are like humans. They're good and bad at the same time, robots that have conf conflicts with themselves and so forth. It's been a, a very, very difficult journey, but for all of that time, robotics was sort of a disappointment. It was more of a fantasy, more a dream than a reality. But I'm here to tell you that this is about to change. There's a couple of very powerful trends behind the scenes that are pushing robotics forward in ways that we could not even imagine. And I'll start with the most obvious trend, and that is Moore's Law, how fast computers have become in the past decades. Now, frequently we look at Moore's Law or extended Moore's Law. This idea that machines, the computers, double the price performance every so many months. And we look at, at, at it at a log scale. It's a little bit confusing. But I took that data and I plotted it on a linear scale. So you can see really how fast computers have become over the past 120 years. So these are gigaflops per dollar. It's a, it's a common measure for how fast computers are. And you can see, look, you look at this, how steep this trend is. This is real data. It's not an artist's rendition. It's not an illustration. And look, how fa look at where we are today compared to history. Look at the poor people in 2010 who thought they had fast computers. And look at where we are today. But if this trend continues, and it will because it's been going steady for almost 120 years, we will look back at today and laugh at where we are today compared to where we're going to be just a few years from now. So when we meet here again in 2029, we'll look back and say, you know, we'll be amazed at how we thought fast, uh, fast computers we had at this time. So you can look at this chart all day long and you can ask yourself, what could you possibly do with computers that are 100 times faster than today? What, download cat movies 100 times faster? What can we do with machines that are this fast? And I argue that what we'll do with this is build better artificial intelligence systems. So let's talk a little bit about how artificial intelligence has moved forward in the last couple of years. So besides computers getting faster, cheaper, and better, there's been this revolution in AI that happened about five years ago where suddenly machines can look at an image like this and in a nanosecond tell you there's a cat and there's a dog. This seemingly trivial thing that any one-year-old child can do has baffled AI researchers for decades. But now we have clever algorithms, neural networks that can do this in a nanosecond, and that in itself, the seemingly trivial thing, is revolutionizing everything from autonomous vehicles to drones to ubiquitous health diagnostics uh, and so on. But besides that, we're seeing a lot of other progressions. We're seeing uh, machines that can do backflips and do incredible things. And you might look at this and you think the world is over. But uh, there are more things that are happening. We have machines that can create new ideas, machines that can design proteins, AI that can design antennas. This is a, a robot that I have in my living room that pa paints oil and canvas and produces uh, really sort of interesting uh, original art on its own. You can even have robots that can detect emotions and can display emotions and smile and do all kinds of things. But people always look at this and they tell me, you know, all this amazing stuff, robots that can detect cats and dogs and do diagnostics and drive cars and do backflips and be creative, all this is amazing, but 
it's amazing that you, know, you have robots that can detect emotions and fake emotions, but will we ever have robots that can have emotions? Or is that something that's unique to humans? Can we have robots that feel? Robots that have consciousness, that think about themselves, that are self-aware? Will that ever happen? Or is that something magical reserved for us humans? So we lump all of this, all of these terms, under this vague notion we call sentience. This idea of machines that have emotions and, and thoughts about themselves and so on. It's something that we, we crave, and we've been trying to build into machines for centuries, but we don't really understand what it is. We don't really understand what, what is sentience and how it works. All the neuroscientists that look at this, and we, we look at humans, but we don't really understand where all these things come from and what's the mechanism. In fact, if you look historically, People, philosophers, theologists, across centuries, across cultures, across religions have been debating and pondering the nature of self-awareness and consciousness in humans. But unfortunately, we haven't made a lot of progress. We still cloak a lot of these terms with, with vague terms that we don't really know what they mean. Sometimes people say consciousness is nothing but the canvas of reality. What does that mean? We don't really know. We can't... We can't translate that into something meaningful. You know, there's this old saying that says, if you, uh, you don't really understand something until you can teach it to somebody else. And I think you don't really, really understand something until you can build it. And so the question is, can we build consciousness into a machine? So what is consciousness? What is self-awareness? So the, the, uh, the definition that I like to use is a very practical definition. And this is the idea that consciousness, self-awareness, is, is simply the ability to simulate yourself into the future. So to the degree that you can imagine yourself in the future, you can predict what you're going to feel, you can anticipate your actions, and you can anticipate the sensations that you will experience. The degree that you can foresee yourself, you can imagine yourself in the future, is the degree to which you are self-aware. So, for example, if you look at this image of a beach, if you can feel the sand under your feet, if you can smell the ocean, if you can hear the waves, you are self-aware. Now, self-awareness is not a black and white thing that you either have or not. There are various degrees. In fact, there's a whole continuum which depends on how well you can predict yourself into the future, how far into the future and what fidelity. So, for example, a dog, might be able to anticipate what it's going to feel in its next meal. Maybe its, it's self-awareness is in the horizon of the next meal or the next day, whereas you might be able to foresee yourself into retirement. So a dog saves food for its next meal, and you save for your retirement. And so our ability to foresee ourselves into the future is really the sort of working hypothesis we have on self-awareness. Now, self-awareness is not just about a hypothetical thing about what you're going to, what, what's going to happen in the future, it also allows you to plan in simulation, in your own internal self-simulation, which is that model that we have of ourselves. So when you look at this pond, these stepping stones on, over the pond, and I ask you, how would you cross this? Could you cross this? You can imagine yourself taking the steps. You can imagine where you're going to put the foot, the first foot, the next foot, and so on, and you can sort of simulate yourself in this in this world, and that allows you to decide whether you want to take this journey or not simply by simulating yourself in your imagination. If I ask you to imagine yourself climbing this tree, you can perhaps foresee yourself grabbing onto this branch or that one and putting your foot there or here, and that ability to foresee yourself and plan in simulation, in your own head, in your imagination, allows you to learn and do things without exerting the, the cost of physical trial and error, which is very expensive. Now, <clears throat> a skeptic might say, wait a minute, we've had simulators for a long time. Robots use simulators all the time, and it's true that almost every robot out there starts its life in a simulation. It's true that we build robots by first designing them in simulation, simulation, programming them, testing them in simulation, even letting them learn in simulation. Almost all the recent amazing results in robotics have all been achieved first 
by learning and simulation. This is work by OpenAI Berkeley of a machine that can gracefully manipulate an object, but that machine learned in simulation for 200 years before it got, it took five minutes on the cloud, but still 200 years worth of training in simulation. This amazingly graceful robot that walks around, and I apologize, I don't know why they keep kicking it. It's surely a nicer way to test this, but this is a, a robot that learns how to walk. It learns how to walk in simulation better than it could learn uh, in reality. So machines can learn in simulation, but here's the difference. All of these simulations were created by an engineer, and simulations that are created by engineers cannot, are laborious to create. We don't know what to simulate, what not. It's difficult, it takes a lot of time, and we don't know what's important to simulate and what's not important to simulate. In fact, simulations cannot keep up with the wear and tear of the robot. So the question is, can the robot acquire its own self-simulation? And that's the last, the missing piece of the puzzle. So the big question is, where do we humans get our self-simulation from? I believe we get it sometime in our infancy. Maybe we're born with some basic structure of it, but we learn a lot in our in our infant years where we play, and that play is not just to kill time, it's actually where we learn physics and we learn about ourselves and we learn about the physics of the world around us and how our muscles move and what sensations we should and should not perceive. So to show you how that works, this is a robot we, we built a couple of years ago uh, now uh, that uh, learns to model itself. This is a very simple robot, has four legs, a couple of sensors and actuators, uh, but it is blind. This robot cannot see the world, it can only sense itself. And it learns, needs to learn how to walk. Now it does that by creating a simulation of itself and we peek inside its brain. It's a very simple robot, we can actually visualize how this robot sees itself. And we can see that in the beginning, it doesn't know if it's a snake or a spider or a tree or an arm, it doesn't know how many parts it has. Two days into the process, it begins to figure out that it has four legs but doesn't quite know how they're connected. And then four days into this process where it's playing around in the playpen, it's formed a self-image that's good enough that it can learn how to walk in its imagination. It doesn't learn how to walk in physical reality that's expensive, slow, and risky. It does, it's not programmed by an external software developer. It learns how to walk in its simulate, inside its brain. And here it is in reality working in the same time, uh, working uh, on its own. Now, when we did this, it was a couple years ago, AI, artificial intelligence, was at a stage where we needed to help this robot visualize itself. We, need, we needed to teach it about Newtonian mechanics. We needed to tell how many motors it has and so forth. We needed to give it a lot of hints. But today, with artificial intelligence making all these leaps and bounds that I showed you earlier, we can do a lot better. So here's another robot, more recent. It's a simple robotic arm, has a couple of motors. But this robot, we give it no information whatsoever about what it is and what it's doing. And it starts off flailing around like a child in a crib. And you can see that the self-image it has of itself has nothing to do with reality. But after a period of about a day, its self-image, which we sort of draw there in a phantom color, is it's not perfect but it's good enough that it allows it to learn how to do simple tasks. And the challenge with this kind of robot is now the, the self-image is such a complex, opaque box that it actually is very, very difficult to extract that self-image out of it. For example, it's very difficult for me to go to any one of you and understand exactly how you see yourself. Create visualizing the self-image is tricky, but with that self-image, the robot can suddenly do new tasks because it can learn not in physical reality, it can learn in its own imagination. And this is a really important aspect. Now, you could look at this robot and you can say, wait, wait a minute, I could program this robot myself to do this kind of task. That's not a very impressive task. But you have to remember, not only did the robot learn how to do this uh, on its own, it learned how to do it inside a simulation of itself that it created. And these are the two ingredients that I think will lead us on the path to self-awareness. To test it, 
uh, we did something very cruel. We removed one of the parts of the robot and replaced it with another bent part, shown in red there. And we watched what happened. And you can see the robot pretty quickly realizes, hey, something's wrong. My self-image predictions and reality don't match. Something's wrong. I need to learn. And it keeps on learning. And very quickly, in about half a day, its self-image also adapts and it continues on its task as if nothing had happened. Just to give you a little bit of data around this, here's a plot showing you performance of two robots, one with a self-model and one without. And you can see that for the same amount of data, point for point, a machine that can model itself can learn a lot faster. In fact, the gap between a machine that learns in physical reality with reinforcement learning and all the fanciest techniques available today will learn a thousand times more slowly or need a thousand times more physical trials than a machine that uses data very sparsely to create a self-image. And I think that gap is the evolutionary origin of self-awareness. Evolution quickly figured out that complex machines like us need to be able to simulate themselves into the future. Because when we can simulate ourselves, we can do a lot more things without the cost and risk and time of trying things out in the physical world. And it turns out that this gap, this advantage, is proportional to the number of degrees of freedom the system has. The more complex system is, the greater the advantage and the impetus for having self-awareness. And so this gift that evolution has gifted us to be able to see ourselves is perhaps the biggest gift of them all because it allows us to do incredible things that no other animal can do. So what are we doing now? We're taking this very same idea that worked for one robot and throwing it on other kinds of robots on slow robots and fast robots, hard robots and soft robots, big robots and small robots. We are trying to throw this on any system that we can find to see how these systems model themselves. Because some systems are e essentially impossible to model using conventional processes. Another interesting thing that we're looking at now is not just how robots can model themselves, but how can robots model other robots? When robots can model other robots, this gives rise to this idea of theory of mind, this interaction that we all have between ourselves. Every, each and every one of us is thinking and modeling what everybody else is doing and thinking. And the ability for robots to model other humans and other robots is the beginning of really social interaction between robots. Now, I spoke a lot about robustness in, uh, in thinking and mental processes. Let me say a couple of words on physical robustness. Our bodies are not just robust mentally, but we can also heal and recover and grow. Whereas you look at most robotics today, they're made of monolithic pieces that are bolted together, and if one piece breaks, it's game over. Can we make machines that are actually can recover their structure and heal? So we did this experiment where we made robots that are not made out of a single part, but made of lots and lots of cells. We call these particle robots to distinguish them from the monolithic robots that are traditional uh, in, in, in this area. And here you see a simple uh, ro robot, particle robot, made out of about half a dozen particles. And these, rob these particles can coordinate with themselves and move around, but if some of them break, the machine still works. Here's a bigger robot that has 100,000 particles in simulation. Uh, and you can see that robot, robot moving forward. In fact, this machine will keep on going even when 20% of the particles are dead. Just like our body keeps on working, even though cells come and go, die, and uh, split, and so on. So the goal is to make machines that utilize this structure, and these particles can assemble together. For example, that rook over there is made of lots of particles that were assembled together through one of these uh, processes. So again, imagine a future where machines are not monolithic. We don't make a robot and when it breaks, we bury it. Instead, we make machines out of lots and lots of particles. And when one machine breaks, another machine can come along and take these parts, this, these parts away from the dead robot and use those parts to make a better robot instead. This is how biology works. We eat plants, plants eat us. We recycle proteins and amino acids all the time. And we have to figure out a way for machines to do this as well. 
So, a lot of ethical questions. Is this going the right direction? Is this something we want to do? Is this going to end badly? Or is this something that we should all be excited about? So I'm, for one, very excited about this. I think the, the benefits far outweigh the risks. Think of a world where almost any autonomous systems, from drones to driverless cars, from smart factories to smart cities, become self-aware, can take care of themselves, can, can uh, recover from damage, and can improve. After all, we keep on building these systems. We have more and more of these automated systems. We cannot afford, as a human race, to keep maintaining these systems. We cannot afford to program these systems. It's too much work. We have to gift these machines the same gift that evolution has given us, the ability to see themselves, to reflect, to adapt, to repair. So it's going to be a very exciting time. And I'll just end with, with, with this closing thought that as a child, I always uh, wondered if one day I'll be able to see an intelligent alien species. I remember reading all these UFO books and Bermuda Triangle and all these different things, hoping that one day I'll be able to see what an intelligent species is going to be like. Now, maybe it's going to happen with all these universes. You just increased my, the, the odds that this might happen. But, uh, but I think it won't happen in my lifetime instead. But I will see an intelligent species. But the intelligent species will come from within us. We will build it. Thank you.